Welcome to A Girl in a Garden on DFCRadio.com. This is your host, Emily. And it's March. That means spring is here. Hopefully it's uh, defrosting in some parts of the U.S. I have to say in Northern California, in wine country, our weather is absolutely amazing. And it means it's time to start planting. And time to start talking about plants and going to garden centers and going to garden events. So I am going to tell you some of the different gardening events that are going on in March 2015. They aren't all in Northern California, and they aren't even all in North America. So lots of great gardening events. If you have any garden event coming up and you would like it shared on A Girl in a Garden, please let me know. My email is agirlinagarden at gmail.com, or you can contact me on Instagram or Facebook, A Girl in a Garden. So today, I'm going to talk about the March 2015 Garden Events, my little recap of CannaCon, what I went to uh, show, a cannabis show that I went to last month, which was a business-to-business show, all about networking, products, great show up in Seattle, Washington, and then I'm going to be talking with Fraser Love from Perpetual Harvest. And he runs a CSA, not quite a CSA, but he sells it at the farmer's market from his front yard garden. So it doesn't matter if you have a tiny, small space, you can still grow tons of fruits and vegetables. So hopefully that can get some people inspired and get uh, get started growing. You don't need a ton of room to garden and you can start small and go big later. Many ways to garden, no way that's wrong. So today we're going to talk about 2015 garden events, March, Canacon, Perpetual Harvest with Fraser Love, and I spent last weekend down in LA and I was at Cerritos Hydro vendor events or customer appreciation day and got to hang out with some of the other guys at DFC Radio, Heavy T was there, Horty Chris, Duff Man, and it was a fun event. We got to drink some beer, have some tacos talk about gardening and meet some great end users who are all into gardening so if you're watching right now you can click uh well if you're listening click watch here now and you can see some pictures in the background of the events great events fun times there's tons of vendor events coming in so you can meet coming up you can meet tons of like-minded people who love gardening and want to share some knowledge so let's get rolling into today's show It's March, and that means spring is in the air, and it's time to go to some of the local trade shows and learn about gardening, buy some plants, meet some like-minded people, and it's great for networking. So the first show, the one that I will be attending, is the Maximum Yield Indoor Garden Expo in Seattle, Washington. It's March 7th to 8th. Saturday, the hours are 12 to 6 p.m. That's industry only. And Sunday, the hours are 12 to 5 p.m., and public is welcome on Sunday. Free tickets can be printed out at IndoorGardenExpo.com, or the cost is $10 at the door on Sunday. So March 7th to 8th, Maximum Yield Indoor Garden Expo in Seattle, Washington. Another big one that's coming up on the East Coast is the Boston Flower and Garden Show at the Seaport World Trade Center. Wednesday and Thursday, the hours are 10 to 8 p.m. Friday and Saturday, the hours are 10 to 9 p.m. And Sunday, the hours are 10 to 6 p.m. The cost for adults per day is $20. Seniors is $17. Children ages 6 to 17 is $10 and children under six are free. More information and ticket purchases can be found at the bostonflowershow.com. 
Here's an event coming up in Central California, and this is the Grow More Garden Supply Vendor event. And they're also having the Grow More Garden Supply Grow University presents full plant nutrition class. And this is March 14th at 10 a.m. This is an in-person or online class. Seating is limited, so you'll need to bring a chair and actually RSVP or pre-register for the events. And you can contact Grow More Garden Supply at 559-348-1055. The full plant nutrition class starts at 10 a.m. And then from 12 to 4 p.m., there will be having a vendor event. And there will be store-wide savings, free food, samples, music, vendor booths, raffles, knowledge, and much more. And that is at 2686 Clovis Avenue, number 109, in Fresno, California, 93722. And some of the vendors that will be present are Fox Farm, Nanolux, Humboldt Wholesale, Mad Farmer, Bounty, Current Culture, Hortolux, General Hydroponics, Botanicare, Sunlight Supply, NPK Industry, T-Lab, and I know there's even more that will be there. So that's March 14th, Grow More Garden Supply in Fresno, California. It's from 12 to 4 p.m. And one of my favorite ones that I'm actually going to be missing this year, but this one's in San Francisco, so if you're in the Bay Area, it's the San Francisco Flower and Garden Show. And the show is March 18th through 22nd at the San Mateo Event Center in San Mateo, California. They do have early bird ticket prices for $17.50 or at the door for $20. An all show pass that you can attend multiple days is $40 and children 16 and under are free. For ticket purchases or to find retail outlets or garden centers that will be selling tickets, please visit sfgardenshow.com. This one, they do display gardens, they do their shopping if you want, plant sales, garden seminars, a kid's area. They have a beautiful bonsai display area. So this is a must-attend event if you are in the Bay Area. It goes on for several days. You can talk to people about native plants. You can talk to your local plant associations, learn about composting. The list goes on and on. I will say I've gone to that event for the last three years, and it's one of my favorite garden shows. So this is the San Francisco Flower and Garden Show, March 18th through 22nd, and San Mateo Event Center at San Mateo, California. And then another one that's coming up, and this is one that I will be attending, is in Barcelona, Spain. It's Spanibus, and that is March 20th through 22nd. Barcelona, Spain, the hours on Friday and Saturday are 11 a.m. to 8.30 p.m. And Sunday hours are 11 a.m. to 8 p.m. The tickets are for a one-day event is 15 euros or 35 euro for the three-day event. More information can be found at Spanabis, S-P-A-N-N-A-B-I-S dot com. It is the world's largest cannabis expo. And this will be my second time attending the show. It's it's amazing. You will see seed vendors, uh, products that you use for end-use products, gardening products, anything you can think about for growing a plant and consuming it will be at Spanibus in Barcelona, Spain. So those are four, five major garden events going on in the month of March. And if you have or know other gardening events coming up, please let me know. Send me an email at agirlinagarden at gmail.com. This information will also be posted on a agirlinagarden.com and you can click on the tab for garden events and it will go through a monthly schedule as they become populated. So 2015 garden events, you can click on the tab on a girl in a garden and find out more information. And until next time, until next month, we'll be going over the April events. Have fun and happy gardening in spring. That would be March 2015.
You are listening to the beautiful Emily Walter on DFCRadio.com. DFCRadio.com. A girl in a garden quick tip. Have you ever been cooking and added too much salt to something? Well, with soup, you can add in some cut up potatoes, throw them in the soup, and let it simmer for about 10 minutes. It will absorb the excess salt, and once you remove them, the dish tastes better. So, for more information and tips, tune into A Girl in a Garden on DFCRadio.com, 5 p.m. Tuesdays. Here at Green Grow, we take organic gardening seriously. With our mycorrhizae products, you'll increase growth and help reduce the need to replace old, worn-out soil. We help provide electrolytes and maximize nutrient intake to make your indoor garden lush and green. So give your plants the strength that they need and breathe life into your soil with Green Grow. Find us at your local nursery or visit us at thegreengrow.com. That's the green, G-R-O.com. You're listening to A Girl in a Garden on DFCRadio.com. DFCRadio.com. On February 19th to 21st, I flew up to Seattle and attended Canacon. And Canacon bills itself as the world's largest cannabis show. And I believe it was their second one. And this was the first of this type of show that I've attended. I've been to the Cups, which are typically put on by High Times Cups. Uh, They have a smoking area. It is a lot more social event and people come to party. Now, this show was a cannabis show, but it was completely different than what people would expect. This was a business networking show, and it was a three-day show that had several seminars, actually. And some of the seminars they put on at this show was greenhouse cultivation, how to raise and manage capital, uh, beyond compliance, how to truly protect your can of business, best practices, lighting technologies, hemp, industrial farming, propagation, extraction methods. It, it had just about anything that you could think of in the realm of commercial cannabis for a trade show with these seminars. And the cost to go to the seminars was $50 a day or the three-day badge was $100. They also offered a bud tending class on Saturday, and that cost $200. They also did industrial hemp-derived CBD, how to be in compliance, stop using bottled nutrients. So that was put on by RAW, understanding manufacturing costs, regulatory updates, Biological horticulture, uh, building a brand, and I will say it was a lot of men in suits and investment money. And this is what's telling us of how this industry has evolved over the years and how it's changed, especially when you compare it to a cannabis cup. So I was up there uh, with the company that I work for, and we had a booth, and this was kind of a trial run to see how the show went. And I have to say, it was one of the better shows I've been to for a business-to-business marketing show to be able to talk directly to your consumers and talk to end users who are using your products on a large-scale use. It's also excellent for marketing and networking, and I have some fun guests lined up that I have met at the show that have innovative products that we have not been able to see in the marketplace yet. I will say 
that there's a lot of stuff in the marketplace as well that's a little bit strange and it might be considered garbage products and a lot of that was being shown at the show and this is something that as this industry evolves we're going to have more and more of these products pop up with the large investment funds think back to the men in suits and money to invest in new products one of the major one was tommy chong was there and he's obviously a very well-known person in the industry and he is backing several products these days and one of them he launched the Tommy Chong Horticulture Elite Horticulture and it is a new lighting company that has paid for his endorsement and it's a lighting company that came out of nowhere they do DE fixtures that actually do not plug directly into the ballast they have a remote cord which does create RF but most people are not going to pay attention to that because they're going to pay attention to the fact that it was endorsed by a celebrity. So as this marketplace evolves, there's going to be a lot more money, professionalism, probably some more funky garbage products. But you're also going to see a lot more scientific data backing stuff up too. And as we're becoming more and more open to talking about this, this show was actually held at Pier 91 in Seattle, uh, the Smith Cove Event Center, which happens to be on federal property. And when you fly up to a legal state to a, to a cannabis-related show, most of the time you do not want to hold it on federal property. So the show does have a few kinks to work out. Part of the reason they did that, though, is it is a non-smoking show. They didn't want to bring that aspect into it, the party aspect. They wanted it more of a business aspect. And... I understand that, but when there's people walking around the show, when you go outside and say you take a break and you do want to smoke, someone might flash a badge on you, and it's a little bit scary. It didn't happen to me, but it held, it happened to a few other people, and it was a little bit different. So you have your normal seed companies there. You have your lighting companies. You have your nutrient companies on large-scale use. You have organizations there, business organizations, normal, um, quite a few different women's groups out there, uh, the human solution, tons of commercial companies, convert, commercial uh, banking companies, so how to bring banking and compliance over to this industry. So to say the least, it was an interesting show, and they do have more of these shows coming up. So I believe the next show is in Denver at the Denver Convention Center in June, and that will be one that I will be attending as well and giving some feedback. I will say at the Denver or at the Seattle show, I was talking to one of my friends this weekend, and she was explaining that, man, we went and we walked the show floor in the downstairs, and we were so not impressed. And I informed her there was actually an upstairs that actually was the carpeted one where the bulk of the booths were. The downstairs was a cemented in area with no doorways, no cell phone usage, and it's where all the seminars were hold, held. Upstairs was where the bulk of the trade show booths were there. And she was not the only person that said, I didn't know there was a downstairs or I didn't know there was an upstairs. So with any show, there's always improvements to be made, but I think this one is on the right track. Uh, the business connections we made were absolutely amazing. And as you, as I just said, you'll be hearing more of them on the show. So that is my recap of a girl in a garden attending Canacon, uh, the world's largest cannabis expo, as they call it. And I, I guess, let me rephrase that. It's the nation's largest cannabis expo. So that is the billing of it. It's Canacon. For more information, you can visit Canacon.org, or they also have a Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash Canacon Northwest. And it's an interesting show, and it's great to see this business evolving into a professional marketplace and watching people get on track for legalization so they can have long-term businesses with infrastructure and employees that they're able to have for a long time. So that's my recap. It's a girl in the garden attending Canacon February 19th through 21st in Seattle, Washington. For 
first part of the journey I was looking at all the life There were plants and birds and rocks and things DFZRadio.com DFCRadio.com. This is your host, Emily. And today I am talking with the urban farmer, urban gardener, named Mr. Fraser Love. How are you doing today, Fraser? I'm good. How are you? I'm fantastic. So you have a company called Perpetual Harvest, which we're going to learn a lot more about. But how about you tell us, how did you get into gardening? Well, I uh, started as a home gardener. My neighbor, uh, a good friend of mine, was a double hort major at the University of Georgia. Uh, amazing hort school, by the way, if uh, anybody wants to know. It is amazing. <laughs> so I became interested in the hobby after seeing what he was doing. Um, he was more than willing to share his knowledge with me. Still is to this day. Any, any question I have, I call him. Um, but from there, I just started as a home gardener. Um, at that time, I was living in an apartment. And so I didn't have a lawn or anything, so hydro or indoor gardening, uh, whatever you want to call it, that was where I started. Um, and I did that. You know, I still do it. I have a grow room here in my house now. Um, never got away from hydro. Uh, basically, a year or so after that, I got a job at the local hydro shop. And for the last 10 years, I've either been working at a hydro shop or in a greenhouse. It sucks you in, doesn't it? It does. It's... um. It uh, pulled me completely away from my major, I mean, which I don't do anything with, and I'm still in debt. But <laughs> Now, this is a question, and I love to ask this question, because a lot of my friends are in their 30s, and we all have degrees in certain things. Did you ever work in your uh, field of study? Um, not really. It's psychology, and there's not much you can do without a master's or a Ph.D., and... Um, you know, I, I just didn't want to spend any more time in college. Probably I just didn't want to sit in an office talking to people, you know, had just as many problems as I've got. So. <laughs> yeah, you find uh, as we're going on, on a little tangent, but it seems like a lot of my friends, at least, we, uh, we've all gotten degrees in certain things. And all of a sudden the love of gardening or a passion of something else has just crept up and we've moved over to that side. Yeah, just too many people I know that started gardening and never quit, and it's become more than a hobby for a lot of people I know. So you got into gardening as a backyard gardener. It's been 10 years. What is some of your uh, training with gardening? Um, well, other than, you know, managing local hydro shops, I worked at a greenhouse for a little while called James Greenhouses. Um, there I managed a large library of tissue cultures. We've received, you know, a half million to a million samples from several countries around the world each week and you know I was involved with uh, managing those making sure everything was all right and they would eventually go and be grown out for larger nurseries that sell annuals and other ornamental plants. So for our listeners out there tissue culture is propagation on a micro level so you can grow plants, mushrooms, human cells, many different things in a petri dish or almost something that's like a film canister, and you can do propagation that way. Anything that uh, has a cellular structure has the ability to be cloned, basically. And for plants or mushrooms, you know, it's a general, an auger formula. Many people may have worked with it uh, in a chemistry class in high school or maybe in college. But you just tweak the uh, formula, you know, the nutrients that are in it for the plant or the mushroom you want to grow, and, you know, you can get a hundred little plants from just a small cellular slice, which is, you know, it's pretty awesome, and pretty awesome technology. It, it is amazing. You can do amazing things with tissue culture and grow, you know, you can start with 10 plant starts and grow 6,500 plants from these little tiny petri dishes that way. Now, one of the things I found with tissue culture is it is extremely detail oriented and it kind of sets you up like a lab because you are doing this typically in a clean room you have to have 
different equipment that you use, and it helps you uh, be prepared for some of these uh, cleanliness practices. It lets you write protocols. Yeah, yeah, it's a uh, it's very tedious process. You've got to you've got to be aware of everything down to the micro level. You're looking at different fungi spores, different bacterial spores, and um, diseases and viruses. It basically once they get into that sterile tissue culture. And they propagate. They can destroy, you know, your precious tissue culture samples within a day or two. And um, so it's something you have to stay on top of. And if you don't, uh, you could quickly lose, you know, lots of money. Um, and there's a lot of science involved with it. I will say from just the small amount of things that I've tissue cultured, I have learned so much about gardening and fungal, bacterial diseases, uh, rooting hormones sugars or carbs that you're feeding your plants it's a whole world of science and gardening right it takes it down to the molecular level we're going into chemical compounds that the cells feed off of um, we're going into areas of what different fungi and mold we're going to compete for with the plant so it's uh like you said it's very detail oriented so you work in a lab that you did tissue culture, or I guess it was a greenhouse. You've managed hydro stores. Uh, you're also a rep for a lighting company these days. But about two years ago, you started a company called Perpetual Harvest. And what is Perpetual Harvest? Um, Perpetual Harvest, I guess in the truest sense, is a cooperative. I work with several different farmers. Um, there's two markets I work with. I'm not a, strictly a CSA um, which means CSAs typically give out a basket each week directly from the farm, and you know there's a dozen or two dozen people that go directly to one farm, and they're able to sustain you know 24 so people, um, maybe eight to ten months out of the year, depending on where you are. But um, this is more like a traditional farmers market. I have one that is an online market. They're actually part of a larger um, co-op called LocallyGrown.net. Um, they're actually all over the United States in several different cities. And here in Athens, we have Athens Locally Grown. And it's pretty cool. Basically, I go on there on Sunday nights. Um, I look out in the, in the garden, see what I have for the upcoming week, what will be ready by Thursday. Uh, create a listing, put a description, upload pictures if I need to. And set my price and you know let her rip from there they come on and they they open the site on sunday nights to the public for the next two days until tuesday night i just watch sales rack up you know hopefully i watch them rack up uh, and then on thursdays i'll go in and drop it off at a central pickup point and a couple hours later the um customers come by and pick up their weekly orders uh you know it's a little different though because a lot of the times you, you think just because it's an online site, you're not going to get to meet your farmer, but they've found a way around that. They have a weekly meet your farmer or guest farmer. He comes in and sets up a booth like you would see at a traditional farmer's market. And so, you know, on a weekly rotation, you'll get to meet the guy that's growing your food or your eggs or even your mushrooms. We have really great shiitake mushrooms and oyster mushrooms around here. Mushrooms are fabulous. So that was my first love. Mushrooms were your first love. Now, a traditional CSA or community supported agriculture is typically a plot of land where members sometimes work the land, sometimes they'll pay a subscription fee and pick up baskets each week with produce that's grown in season on that land. And what you guys are doing, it's a little bit different, is your several small micro farmers are participating in it to bring enough produce for people to come and pick stuff up. Right. Some of them, some of them are larger farms that have their own CSAs that will give away what's left um, on the online market. But the majority of us on there are sub-acre um, farms or plots of land that are just trying to get our name out there. I mean, I really just started uh, – Perpetual Harvest to get the name out there to get something started because at that point in time when I started it I really wanted I was headed towards a goal of actually having my own farm and eventually having my own real CSA where I could support you know a few dozen people um, so that's where it evolved from 
So when you originally uh, started Perpetual Harvest, you were growing mainly for yourself. And was this some way to get rid of the excess that you have, or you had the actual goal in mind to have it, your own CSA? It was the goal of a CSA. I knew from the beginning that it wasn't just going to be for myself. I, you know, produce more food than I can consume, but not enough to, you know, support a CSA. So I had to find a way to get, you know, not waste the food, to get it somewhere, to get it to a market. And, and luckily, Athens locally grown. Um, and this year, West Broad Farmers Market uh, allowed me to do those things, allowed me to get my small amount of produce out to market and I've made a name for myself around here and it's it's actually helped you know it's not a major amount of income by any means you know pays for my beer every week that's about it (laughs) (laughs) so (laughs) so anyway it's not a it's not a major income but it's a way to get me started towards the ultimate goal I've been looking for um you know the CSA So your ultimate goal is a CSA, but right now you call yourself an urban farmer, urban gardener. What is your growing space right now? It's it's very small. Um, It's almost laughable, but I put out enough to to go to weekly markets. I'm working 200 square feet of traditional horizontal growing space, 12 grow beds, 4 by 4 and then I added an additional 200 square feet of vertical growing space. I put up an A-frame trellis. Um, and then I've got a hundred or so square feet inside um, for hydro, so it provides me with enough to get a nice sized table going at the market to where I can make you know a few bucks and get my name out there and you know make it you know, this is, <clears throat> this town is basically built on you know friendships and handshakes and it's a very communal based town, so the more I get my face out there the more people begin to trust my products. For example, when I first started, people would barely buy from me. And I would, you know, I'd talk to the other farmers. I was like, what's going on? Is my, you know, is everything all right? And they're like, you're new. They just don't want to buy from you. They haven't seen you here for more than a couple weeks. And they're right. You know, it just takes a little time. And once I started to get to know people, I'd sell out each week. And it's only gotten better from there. So you always hear the phrase of know your farmer, and one of the ways you get to know your farmer is going to farmer's markets or CSAs or doing these kind of cooperatives like you're involved in, and it, you talk about growing practices. Not all of farmers are organic right. or organic certified, but they are using organic growing practices, and you kind of have to gain the trust of the shoppers out there in order to attract customers. Yeah, it's, um, you know, organic certification is it's hard to come by. It's a lot of red tape. Um, it's a lot of money. A lot, a lot of these, money. <laughs> a lot of these farmers, you know, myself included, don't have that kind of money or time to, you know, invest all that into it. So we, we work on an honor system, basically. Uh, they do come and check how you're growing. They do constantly ask questions. You are, you are screened. Um, it's not just like, hey, okay, you got tomatoes, you know, you're good to go. You have to go through a pre- preliminary screening. Um, but after that, it, it's pretty much an honor system. And you, you work from that point on um, just gaining trust, you know, with your customers. You do the meet your farmer day at Athens Locally Grown or the more you're at your local weekly farmer's market you know, the more people get to know you and, you know, you begin to discuss growing practices. And once they get to know you and they understand how you're growing and they know they can trust you, then relationships start building and things just go from there. You know, we don't need all the red tape to do it the right way, you know. You just got to do it. Get out there and grow. We are going to take a brief break from our interview with Fraser Love from Perpetual Harvest and hear from a Girl in a Garden show sponsors. Here we are. Here we are. You are listening to the beautiful Emily Walter on DFCRadio.com. DFCRadio.com. Oh. 
A girl in a garden quick tip. Have you ever been cooking and added too much salt to something? Well, with soup, you can add in some cut up potatoes, throw them in the soup, and let it simmer for about 10 minutes. It will absorb the excess salt, and once you remove them, the dish tastes better. So for more information and tips, tune into A Girl in a Garden on dfcradio.com, 5 p.m. Tuesdays. Here at Green Grow, we take organic gardening seriously. With our mycorrhizae products, you'll increase growth and help reduce the need to replace old, worn-out soil. We help provide electrolytes and maximize nutrient intake to make your indoor garden lush and green. So give your plants the strength that they need and breathe life into your soil with Green Grow. Find us at your local nursery or visit us at thegreengrow.com. That's the green, G-R-O, dot com. You're listening to A Girl in a Garden on DFCRadio.com. DFCRadio.com. Welcome back to A Girl in a Garden on dfcradio.com. And we are in the middle of an interview with Fraser Love from Perpetual Harvest. So in the small gardening space or growing space that you have, what kind of crops do you grow? Um, everything from leafy greens to tomatoes and super hot peppers. Uh, pretty much I grow the weirdest stuff I can find. Baker Creek's probably my favorite. Uh, seed company out there just because you can find just just about anything and they're everything. a good one <laughs> they, have the, they have some of the strangest stuff and <laughs> i went to a trade show i think it was the san francisco garden show this year and i met one of their seed hunters and his yeah. job is to travel around the world and explore and find heirloom seeds yeah i follow him on uh facebook he's really interesting he looks like he has a fun job yeah, and I talked to him maybe for like 40 minutes, and he was eccentric and amazing, and he had my dream job. Sometimes I hear uh, there used to be a show called Strain Hunters, which were very crop-specific, and right. then I found out he was uh, basically a strain hunter for heirloom vegetables, and I was like, that's Yeah, that's I how I equated it. I was like, this guy looks like he works for strain hunters, but in a legit way. <laughs> not saying it's not legit, but um, <laughs> it's just different crops out there, so I was like... It's it's pretty cool the different varieties that they have. I have pink bananas seeds right yeah, now. Yeah, I, I, I had some of those too. They uh, I could not get them to sprout. I don't know. I I'm don't gonna know. have to try. <laughs> yeah, I tried. I tried my darnest, but I couldn't. I couldn't get them to sprout. But you know, they have some really really cool stuff. Like one of the favorite things I've grown um, is a tigger melon. Uh, basically, like tigger from Winnie the Pooh. He looks it looks like a striped tiger. It's a it's a small white melon with orange stripes. It's really interesting, nice, you know, kind of like a, a honeydew melon with a little bit more sweetness. But, you know, had, I've had white tomatoes, um, Romanesco cauliflower or broccoli, whatever you want to call it. Um, some very strange green beans in all varieties of colors, even striped. So it's just, it's been, it's a fun process. What I... I'm not really looking to grow anything specific. I'm looking to see what grows around here and uh, what, you know, what grabs people's attention at the market because, you know, the more you go to the market, you, you start to realize what people grow at home, what they eat. And around here, as much as I like tomatoes and as well as they grow, pretty much every home gardener has a tomato plant. And so, you know, I've learned to kind of shift gears and, and move to something that, you know, the crowd wants to buy, um, not rather than what I want to grow, you know. What do some of your shoppers think of these different varieties, these different kind of rare heirloom varieties? <laughs> I get I get mixed reactions. I mean, I had white tomatoes last year. People had no idea what they were. I had a lot of these people, some of these markets, um, they've never seen an heirloom before, so they think all tomatoes are red, and I had some 
yellow striped tomatoes, um, solid yellows. I had some orange tomatoes this year. And, you know, you get these strange looks, and they look at you like those can't be real or you know, organic or anything. They think a lot of the times they think my stuff genetically modified because it just looks so odd, but I have to explain to them that it's heirloom and that it's been grown this way for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's funny trying to explain some of these odd looking varieties when most of these people are just used to going into the local supermarket and picking up a better boy tomato that's been grown in a hot house and picked while it was green that has no flavor so tastes like just something red but yeah it's just an educational process that you have to go through with the public um but you know i can tell you once they try an heirloom once they try some of these crazy looking you know fruits and vegetables they come back the next week wanting more so I've never really had anybody turned away from them. You know, it's just the initial educational process that you have to take people through. So I have to ask your opinion. What did you think of the white tomatoes? So they're not I, – I thought they were awesome looking. That's the reason I got them. And they're just really cool looking tomatoes. But there's no flavor. I mean, I can see why they're not grown and why they've been either hybridized or bred um, for more flavor because these – they have no acid, which most people I've learned around here, like the yellows and the orange, they don't have acid, so they won't buy those as much as my reds. Um, and along with no acid, there's no sweetness either. Like, you get a lot of sweetness from yellows and oranges, um, but this is just, it was just meaty, very bland, beautiful to look at, but bland. I, I grew a tomato last year called the Indigo Rose Tomato, and it yeah. was like a purple, almost glitter color, and it was the most beautiful tomato I've ever seen in my life. Right. If I had a choice, though, I would never grow it again because of the taste. What, what was the flavor like? It just wasn't very good, especially when you compare it to the other heirloom varieties. It was, it was, it was kind of meaty. And there wasn't the sh the sugar or the bricks levels weren't there, and it just wasn't good. If I compare it to different heirloom varieties and the amount of effort I put into it, I probably wouldn't grow it again. Yeah, and and that's I've run across those problems. It's just kind of like you know a trial and error process. You find stuff that works good for your zone. You find stuff that actually you know sells, tastes good. You know you go through different phases, and I'm definitely not anywhere right now to where I've decided on which variety of tomato I'm going to grow or which pepper. I mean, the beauty of, a, of the beauty of perpetual harvest is basically the fact that it's just, I don't really have much to lose with it. <laughs> it's just at this point, it's, it's an experiment. Um, and I can, I can afford to screw around with it. I can afford to grow weird vegetables that may not have the best flavor, but you know, it, in the same time, I'm learning what grows, how to grow it, what the market wants. It's a great experience and an overall great learning experience, too. So, And it's always fun to try new things. And that's the joy of gardening, even if you're trying to make, well, maybe not always the joy if you're trying to make money out of it, but trying new things. And one of my favorite things to do in the garden is to have some of my staples and have something new each time. And I will say I failed hard sometimes on the new stuff of like, oh, that didn't taste good. Oh, that does not grow in this zone very well. Yeah. Eh, it was really pretty, but blah, 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 blah. It's susceptible to diseases. So it's part of the joy of gardening. You don't always succeed, but you get some therapy out of it, right? Right. And that's the way therapy should be. It should test you. It should push you. It should, you know, it should be a learning experience at the, at the you know, the heart of the matter. So now that we're talking about therapy, it sounds like you did use your degree. Well, you know, it's, it comes out sometimes. You know, it's several thousand dollars worth uh, worth of a degree. It might might as well get it out sometime, right? <laughs> might as well. So you say you have a really, really small growing area. Are you growing in your backyard or your front? It's in the front yard. So you're in the south, and sometimes I read Southern Living and some of these other blogs in the south, and... When I think of the South, I think of extremely manicured, <laughs> fertilized, freshly cut lawns. And you're not wrong. I mean, they're everywhere. There's certain neighborhoods, HOAs, and stuff like that that 
dictate what you can do in your front yard, even though you paid for it outright and, you know, it should be your land to do with as you please. But I'm, you know, I'm lucky in the sense that I live in a city that has several urban farms for neighborhoods, um, several teaching farms. Many people have their own raised bed gardens in their front or backyard. So it's not uncommon here. I don't uh, get any problems from, you know, the local county enforcement or anything like that. So what kind of feedback have you gotten from your neighbors about having a front yard garden? The feedback's been good for the neighbors. They'll come by. I've had people stop, you know, talk for a little while, discuss with me what I'm doing, you know, what I'm growing. And, you know, I just tell them about perpetual harvest. So it helps me build relationships with people uh, again. I mean, it just it's an attraction point and people come in, you build relationships and you find new connections and you get new leads. And that's one of the ways I got into some of the farmer's markets that I do. You know, I, I met people that either bought from the farmer's market or worked at the farmer's market themselves. So it's a, uh, it's definitely a useful, useful networking tool, um, to say the least, you know. So from starting a garden to a farmer's market to perpetual harvest, what's your number one advice that you would give to other people that are thinking about doing this? It's <laughs> a good question. That's a loaded question, I think. It is. <laughs> um, patience is key. Uh, you, you really have to understand that Farming in general is not a lucrative career. Uh, it can be, you could fail and one year, one crop could cause you to go under. So it's, it's something you have to take very seriously. You have to plan very seriously. Um, it's something you have to plan for. It's something you have to keep an eye on. It's something you have to keep an open mind with. No, you can't. You can't be a quitter, basically. Um, you've got to fight through the hard times because farming is not an easy thing to do. It's it's hard work. It's long hours. It's a lot of attention needed. But um, like you said, it's a form of therapy. So even though it's hard work, a lot of people find that it outweighs the uh, the benefits outweigh the, the work. That's what I'm trying to say. And it does. I, I only... I have a 15 by 15 gardening space and I think I harvested 15 pounds of carrots this week from a very, very small area and just digging in the dirt and getting out away from the office, away from the computer is so helpful. It clears your mind. It lets you think about other things. Yeah. I spend enough hours staring at a computer that, um, I'll happily get on my hands and knees and dig through the dirt. Tell your boss to stop making you do that. I know. I've tried to tell her she's a slave driver, but she doesn't listen. <laughs> and for all of our listeners out there, uh, Frazier and I actually work together in our uh, real life job, and I guess I'm a slave driver. <laughs> Horrible. I was Horrible. Gonna, I was putting in my notice, writing it up as we speak. Not accepting it today. <laughs> So, but, I mean, one of the things that I ended up meeting Frazier is because he had perpetual harvest. And he did front yard gardening. He did urban gardening. And a keen interest on gardening. And you also said that you have a hydroponic setup. What kind of crops do you grow indoor? Basically, I'm only using fluorescent T5 fixtures. Um, I don't want to pay for a large HPS lamp. I definitely don't want to drill a hole in my ceiling to run some ducting through it. And I especially don't want to visit from the local police because they tend to harass people around here. You that, live in the uh, South, which is totally different than California. <laughs> it's, it's, it's wild. They, um, they'll sit at the local hydro shops, take down people's plates, tag numbers, and run them. And, you know, if you've got any priors, then you've got trouble, um, even if you don't have priors, they've been known to come and search your trash. So it's it's something here that it, you're kind of risking a lot. And that's one of the reasons I post everything on Perpetual Harvest is because I want people to see that I'm doing something, you know, that's legit for my area um, that I don't have to have any trouble. So I'm, I'm only working under T5s right now. So it only really allows me to do leafy greens, um, kale, lettuce 
mustard greens, tat soy, uh, anything that sautés well or anything that makes a nice crunchy salad I enjoy uh, growing inside. And fast-growing greens, they have a really fast turnover, which I just said fast-growing greens. So you can grow a lot of crops really fast, and T5s are perfect lighting for those types of crops. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've got three T5s, and I'm, you know, turning out more than enough, and it's going just as fast as I would under an HID. I mean, it's just, you know, HID would be overkill at this point. There's no reason to put that many, you know, that much light on top of a head of lettuce. So it works just fine for me. I can turn over a head of lettuce from seed, you know, seven to eight weeks, depending on the variety. And if you do a perpetual harvest, if you will, you know, you're putting in a, a new cell each week or each uh, half week, you're never, you're never without a harvest. So if you find ways to maximize your space, you can really pump out a lot more, uh, food than you would really think in a, in a 10 by 10 bedroom. So for our listeners out there, perpetual harvest is actually a gardening style. Uh, it's, it's non-trademarked name. Uh, what is perpetual harvest? Perpetual harvest is kind of a, an old school term. Uh, that's been around for several years that I first found it in the forums, but it's technically it's successive planting and successive harvesting where there's no gap between seeding and harvesting. So each each week you're planting more seeds and you're harvesting more lettuce, and there's no gap. There's no one week that you're not planting and harvesting. You're continually doing both. Hence perpetual harvest. <laughs> right, perpetually growing. So for our listeners out there, we can find you on Facebook. You say you post a lot of pictures. You also post a lot of gardening information. What is your Facebook page? Uh, Facebook's just Perpetual Harvest. It's very simple. Um, I don't do a lot of stuff on Facebook anymore. Most of it's linked to my Instagram. So if anybody really wants to you know, see what I'm doing, that's the place to follow me. So it's Perpetual underscore Harvest? Yeah. So you can find him on Instagram. And you post some great photos. And you also write for some of the other magazines that are out there. Is that correct? Yeah, I haven't written in a little while. I've been so busy with my new job. but Someone's uh, a slave driver. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, know, you know how it is. <laughs> no, but seriously, I, I've been writing for Grozine since, what was it, I guess April, March or April. Um, so I started with them. They hadn't been around for very long, but Eric Bixa, he's a great guy. He's well-known in the industry, and he gave me a, a chance at writing, and I, I'm very thankful for that. It's actually done more for me than you know, most other things I've done, even more than Perpetual Harvest. So. And one of my favorite articles that I read was how to do tinctures. Yeah, we um, we wanted to do kind of an idea, something – Eric's whole thing about Grozine is he wants everything about plants, from growing them to harvesting them to utilizing them in various ways. So I wrote an article on making um, a stinging nettle tincture. I have a friend. She, she, she basically she does this. I have a friend that studies this at school. She does a lot of extracts, a lot of tinctures, and a lot of concentrates, um, like she'll bring us, you know, chapsticks and lotions and salves and balms or whatever you want to say. And she took my nettle from my permaculture plot and basically soaked it in high proof alcohol. You can do anything over 100 proof. And you soak it for about eight weeks and it pulls out all the goodness, all, you know, the vitamins, minerals, um, even anti carcinogens in there. And, uh, stuff like that. And so all of that's concentrated down into a very small dosage. So instead of having to eat a large plate, you can actually take a couple eye drops and drop them into your water and you'll get the full dosage kind of like uh, you would from a supplement or something, but it stays fresh unlike a supplement that oxidizes. So it's a good way to preserve all of the beneficial things within plants and it just became it became one of my favorite articles that I've written just because it was not something that I did by myself. It was also a learning experience for me, and I was able to share that with other people. So 
Dude, it was a it's a cool article. I might eventually write more articles um, about doing extracts or different ways of utilizing medicinal herbs um, for per- personal use. You know. Yeah, and that was a really interesting article. Uh, you don't always hear about tinctures, or you hear about a specific type of tincture, and a lot of people don't realize that the plants are living things, obviously, and it's a lot of ways that we get our nutrition. Nutrition does not come in prepackaged boxes of, I guess I'm just going to say crap, of just stuff you get from the grocery store. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. It is prepackaged crap is what it is. And this is just like preserving uh, food at the end of a season. This is the same thing, the same idea. You're just doing it, utilizing it different ways. Um, creating, you know, topical products as well as uh, supplemental products. I have a bunch of uh, tinctures and stuff in my purse right now that uh, one of my other guests on the show sent me. She sent me a bunch of canatastic uh, tinctures and rubs that she made, and it's really amazing stuff, all with these essential oils that she extracted herself. It's very similar to tinctures, and it's amazing. It's for your body, it's for your health, it's for your mind. Right, and you know, if you know the person that makes them, you know there's no fillers, or you know there's no weird carcinogens in there. Um, a lot of it's all natural because it's made, you know, at, at someone's home where they don't have access to all of these toxic chemicals. So it's a good way to actually get something that you know is going to be safe for you to consume or to use on your body or in your body. Well, I have to say, Fraser, thank you so much for joining me today, talking a little bit about gardening urban farming and tinctures and other things that you can use with plants, not necessarily eating them, but there's so many uses for plants out there and get out there and grow something. That's everyone should be able to grow something. Do it. Do it. Just do it. So thank you, Frazier. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. So there you hear it. Frazier Love from Perpetual Harvest on A Girl in a Garden on DFCRadio.com. From liquor and fast food, stay away. American soup and poison every day. Fake ingredients never crave your body is a temple. Welcome back to A Girl in a Garden on DFCRadio.com. Big, big thank you to Fraser Love from Perpetual Harvest for joining me today. Talking about urban gardening, you don't need a ton of space to grow. Start small, grow big. Tons of things you can do with gardening. And spring is here, so let's let's get out there and start gardening. What are you going to do this year? What are you going to grow this year that you haven't grown before? I know I have some lettuce going on right next to my desk that needs a little bit more TLC, but I am, I'm getting that gardening bug, and I need to go out and garden. So next week, actually this week, because it's Tuesday, but Saturday and Sunday I'll be up in Seattle talking with other people about gardening. Uh, next, a new show next Tuesday, obviously. Talk about gardening, of course. We have some fun guests lined up. And if you ever have questions, suggestions, contact me, a girl in a garden at gmail.com. Looking forward to talking with all of you. And until next time, this is Emily on A Girl in a Garden on dmcradio.com. God plant a garden here. It's the beginning, it's on the lower written.